Good. Hello, everyone. Thanks for everyone for joining me. Thanks to Mel. Thanks to Rachel. Thanks to Andy. That's the order there on my screen. I suspect it's entirely different on everyone else's. Um, and thank you to the audience all for joining. It's an absolute honour. I'm Ben from our bookshop in Tring. And um, it's become an honour to be hosting two or three of these events a week. If not, I should try four next week, would you believe? And it's just, a, it's just such a joy. I get to speak to these brilliant authors who... Um, uh, who just who were just pleased to be talking to someone? I think half the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Andy from Absolute Radio has very kindly stepped up to um, to interview the pair of them. I am going to stay here, uh, dare I say it, and I am going to be the conduit for the audience. So your job uh, as an audience is to use the Q and A function. You'll see it along the bottom. Um, type in messages um, and questions for uh, for Rachel and Mel, and uh, and I will be the conduit for that. Meanwhile, Andy and Mel and, and Rachel are going to be chatting about um, about books and any other subject that might pop up. But um, without further ado, let me hand over uh, to Andy. Well, listen, yeah. yay! Well, listen, yay. Good, good to everyone here uh, in the chat as well. Uh, we we were having quite an extensive conversation about the colour of Ben's walls in his lounge just before we got going. Ben uh, is con convinced that the 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 lounge wall colour is blue, but we're all seeing green here. I'm not sure what you guys at home are seeing as well. So green. I <laughs> It's so, so green. Rachel, do you, would you say green? Oh, it's definitely green. I've never seen such a green. There's a lot of green going on in the chat. We can see that here as well. Keep those questions coming in. Well, <laughs> let, let's start off by talking about uh, these are strange times. How have you been getting on uh, during the lockdown? Rachel, how's it been for you, firstly? You been OK? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been fine in that, you know, I'm, I'm lucky. I have a home and I have my children came back for a while. So we had kind of family time and we're healthy. So, yeah, we're fine, basically. But I think I'm beginning to really struggle now. I think this this time, just the the sense for, for me of feeling unfocused is just beginning to really get to me. Okay. And just that kind of you're just not, I mean, I'm a very quiet person. I'm very insular. And for me, the idea of being able to stay at home is great. I've spent my entire life trying to stay at home. But actually, I realise I miss banging up against, you know, strangers, things I don't know. I really, really miss it. I think I need it, actually. Yeah, and as authors, I guess you, you people watch a lot, and that's where some of the inspiration for what you do comes from. So, Mel, would you say you're missing the, the being able to go and sit in a cafe and, and see what people are up to? to... I'm going. I'm going slightly bananas, like Rachel. I absolutely. I'm not very insular as a person. I don't think. I think I need to be in a gang a lot. Uh, I'm a bit of an exhibitionist, and um, I'm. I'm missing. I'm missing the the live audience. You know. Um, but like you, Rachel, it's. Uh, I feel very very lucky, and I've been able to do some work and family are fine we're healthy so what more could you ask really and Bushy, I, are you okay i'm okay i think i'm a little bit like rachel i am i'm starting to climb the walls i think during this last lockdown seems to be the one where uh, all the all the the uh gardening and knitting is uh was, was very locked down too wasn't it i think the the kind of energy has gone out of that side of things I think january and february was definitely a tough month where well, you could sense it uh, oh. uh, through our community as well it was a tough tough pair of months but I, we've got the we've got the light at the end of the tunnel then so mm. We have indeed. Oh, well, listen, uh, let's talk about the, the joy of having a book out. A friend of mine who's had a book out recently said that it's so strange to see the thing that's been so personal to you suddenly sat there on the shelf of a bookshop and out in the wide world amongst other things. What's it like to finally release a book that you've been working on on your own for so long, Rachel? Let's start with you. What, what's it like to have that book out there? Spent, it's always speaking. it's always really exciting when you when you let go and you kind of um you know that there's nothing you can do anymore, but it's a good thing, as opposed to that bit where you're editing and editing and you, you know, you're constantly just trying to just find the bigger thing or dig deeper. But I mean, having done it, this is my fifth, I think now, and um, it's just been so different during lockdown, not having, as we're saying, that chance to meet readers. And actually what you get when you meet readers, and I didn't know this is before, is you, you sense what the identity of the book is beyond you. And it seems it kind of has felt a very introverted process, the public, you know, publishing a novel. So now I'm loving it when people get in touch with me via Instagram or in, just just telling me how they've responded to the book. People I don't know, because you would have got that 
in, in book views. And Mel, you'd have had so many people. I mean, may, hopefully you will quite soon, you know, because meeting readers, I think, is so important for writers. Yeah, absolutely. And Mel, the same for you with the best things? Yeah, I mean, I felt, this is my first novel, I felt so excited on publication day on April the 1st, even though we couldn't have the book launch that I'd really wanted to have, you know, with, with mates and family and stuff. Um, I felt quite sick with nerves. Um, and I still do when I think of actually people reading the book. I mean, incredibly excited, but also very, very nervous. Um, um, and it's, uh, you know, like you're saying, Rachel, it's I've had a few messages from people who've read it. And that is, oh, my, it's an amazing feeling that somebody is actually out there has read has read the book that that. Yeah, I wasn't kind of expecting that. I feel oh, I feel quite sort of woof, you know, the old the old hairs coming up on the. What's it called? I've actually forgotten all my vocabulary. You've used up all your yeah. words. <laughs> but that's that's a lockdown thing as well, I think, not being able to talk anymore. I went, yeah. I went and tried to buy something the other day and they said, how many do you want? And I said, I want well, <laughs> I just, I couldn't even say, I couldn't even say two. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mel, from, from a debut perspective, as you say first novel, how, how, how has the literary world been in terms of, you know, like being a newbie in terms of a, a novel side of things? How's that been for you? Have been welcoming? Um, in terms of other people in the world of the literary? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, tr tremendous, actually. Really, really lovely. I mean, I sort of have a feeling that um, social media might be a good thing possibly to dip one's toes into is that right Rachel that loads of authors are on Instagram and things like that is that a good thing to do I think Instagram yes I mean I've always managed to avoid Twitter I mean it's just I feel it would just it's not a good place for me to go but Instagram I do do occasionally I mean what else can we do I think it's the only way you can you know make contact with people and when bookshops aren't open how do we let people know that there's a book yes yeah absolutely uh, do, you, do you think it's changed things th there's things that you've learned during the lockdown Rachel which will improve you know the way that you interact with the audience going forwards like like you say using stuff like Instagram will it change a load of authors do you think no I'm just going to just love my bookshop even more I mean I'm just so relieved that they're opening again and that the pressure is slightly off me I yeah. <laughs> it doesn't suit me really social media I wish I was better at it but I'm not I bet so, you um, yeah. <laughs> So am I right in thinking then, say, for every book that gets published, there must be ideas that are knocked back or it doesn't work out. Is that the case with you guys? There are a couple of attempts before you get to the, the book that you end up writing. Mel, were there, were there a couple of other stories that you pursued first before you ended up with the best things? Um, that's an interesting question. I'd had this idea, um, the plot for the best things. I'd had it kind of sculling around um, in my head actually for years and years and I knew that I wanted to write that very particular story um I hope there is another story in there there's a, I've got the slight feeling of and I know I should enjoy the fact that I've got my first novel out I really should just let that be and enjoy it but I'm already I'm waking up at 3 48 every morning <laughs> Literally, 348, you know, the digital, uh, uh, the green digital number <laughs> every morning thinking, the second book, what am I going to do? I, I need the plot. I, I, and I've got some ideas, but um, it's a weird one. So in answer to your question, I would say that I was fairly single minded, actually, yeah. up, up to this point about what that story was and what it would be. I mean, as I started to write it. Um, and I'd be interested to to hear about this from you, Rachel. I found that my brain sort of went off on tangents and different characters appeared that I hadn't expected to meet and characters that I actually really loved. And I sort of thought, right, I'm going to stick with you for a bit. Um, but I think I, I, I had quite a sort of um, well set out chapter breakdown and all that kind of stuff, uh, which I quite liked. I quite like knowing where I'm going, but very, very happy to go off on many tangents. It's a lot longer the book than I thought it would be. I thought it would be sort of, I thought books were kind of about 200 pages. There's a demo from Ben there. There we are. It's, that is a, that's a thick old tomb, isn't it? That's a tome. That's that is. I know, I know. I hope it's not, I hope it's not too long. But anyway, um, no, I just really loved writing it so very, very much um, that I want to do another one. 
<laughs> so, so Mel, did you did you plot? Did you plot everything before? Did you know exactly where you were going to go, or did you think you knew where you were going to go? Yeah, I I did. I did actually. I thought I'm never ever going to write this unless I've got a beginning, middle, and an end. So I did. Yes, I did actually. I plotted it. Post-it right. notes. What was it? A wall chart. What was your plotting material, Mel? What did you use? I would love to have, like you get on those um, crime dramas, I'd love an incident room. Pins and, and string or something, that'd be good, <laughs> it? Yes, or, or like um, Tom Cruise with the sort of invisible, the glass thing. And Minority the... Report. Oh, exactly. Yes. No, it was very, very, very dull. It was uh, revision cards. I nicked some off my daughter. It was those horrible <laughs> revision cards with lines on uh, in, in horrid colours. So I laid all those out on the on the floor and did a bit and did a bit of that. I'm not good with plot though. I'd, how good are you with plot, Rachel? Are you are you a plotty plotty person? I don't know that I'm. I mean, I I think plot is important, um, really important, because you want people to keep turning the pages, you know. And it's you know stories. It's things happen in stories, but I'm not a good planner. I'm actually plot. I normally can plot my book once I've finished it. <laughs> I could I, I could then tell you, you know, what my plot Retrospect, is. retrospective plotting. Yes, I'd be very, very, very good at it at that point. But I am I have become a, a post-it note fan. Nice. I do love a post-it note. And I'm lucky we do have a very, very big window. And once once I'm kind of thick in a book, it's just covered in post-it notes. Oh, really? Like a sort of Venetian blind of I think it is. I think the incident <laughs> room analogy is probably closer. Yes. Yeah. Like a wash of pink and yellow. Rachel, have you have you learned anything or had any kind of techniques passed on to you from other authors about way? And is there like a right or wrong way to to put a book together? Does, has anyone ever given you any tips that you've taken on board? No, I mean only ones that I I once did an event a very long time ago, an actual event with actual people there, Maybe. and um, I was asked the question: Do you do you write the big? Do you write the end before you've got to it? And I knew that there was a writer in the audience who I really admired. And so I answered the question very honestly and said, yes, I often do write the ending way before I get to it. Because for me, the beginning and the ending are very much related. And they're, they're kind of like, I don't think I said all this, but they're like a sort of question and answer. Or, you know, they are, if they, they, they call to one another. I feel it's really important that they're related. Anyway, yeah. I said all this at great length. Then I went to her talk and she was asked the same question. And she said, any writer who tells you they write the beginning of the book and the end is the dullest writer I have ever come across. No. <laughs> right, who was it? Who yeah, was it? We'll go and get him. We'll go yeah. and get him after this. Yeah, Bush and I'll go and sort them out. Don't you worry about that. So, so, that, so I did learn that, but actually I still do it. And, and am I right? Am I right in thinking, Rachel, that you you, you uh, write in a caravan? You have a, a writing caravan. Is, is, please elaborate on that. It's a fantastic thing. Well, it's yeah. I mean, it is. It's fantastic if I get to it. I don't always get to it, but yeah, it's my it's my space. It's got my stuff in. It's like my bedroom without a bed. You know, it's it is that my room with a view. Oh, lovely. Where's yeah. your caravan, Mel? Have you got a writing caravan? Now, um, <laughs> I wrote the best things in my local library, actually. Uh, certainly the first draft of it because I started writing at home and I would rather do anything than sit down at a desk with a computer and be on my own and write it turns out I, mean, I, got, <laughs> I, I got into it I got into it so I t I pitched up at the local library five to nine every morning Monday to Friday I had to be there at five to nine because then I would get the chair that I loved and wanted to sit in, which was a blue, spongy sort of swivel chair, um, slightly Dr. Evil, um, that looked out onto the car park. And I found that really comforting because it was there was sort of almost nothing to see except for kind of Austin Allegro's coming in and out. And I found that quite soothing. Um, so a caravan, not quite yet, but the local library. Major. Rachel, you you are a volunteer, a volunteer librarian, is that correct? So you've got a lot of love for libraries in your life. I, I do love libraries very, very much. Yeah. And I was I was involved for a number of years, still am in a scheme uh, to to award local libraries. Uh, it's um, kind of it's a sort of funding to, to oh God, I'm losing all my vocabulary now uh, for it rewards lo local libraries for increasing their footfall. 
Okay. That's what I'm trying to say. So you see all the schemes that local librarians are employing in order to get more people into the library and borrowing books. And it, it means a lot to me. So on the back of that, I became a volunteer librarian, not a very good one because um, I sort of basically I'm not allowed to do anything I've discovered apart from, but I do chat to people. Oh, nice. And a lot of people do go to the library to chat. And I didn't realize at first that we are allowed to chat. So I was kind of doing quite, quite quiet talking and then I realized that no libraries now you're allowed to I didn't really have a conversation well I got slightly annoyed because <laughs> <in my life. laughs> because it was quite noisy actually yeah. I'd be sort of in my chair and I'd be kind of going Shh, like that <laughs> that probably wasn't cool at all but um no it's all changed phones people on phones in the library that was that was surprising do yeah, they still so have um dvds in there people go and rent dvds yeah. and stuff is there a little section there yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't even allowed to get the DVDs out, though. I, I mean, I was allowed to do remarkably little. I could show people where the toilets were. And you'd be amazed how many people wanted to come in and just use the toilet. I agree. Really, you might have bumped into Mel at some point during the writing process. <laughs> uh, did you, were you able to dish out a late return fine, Rachel? Tell me at least they let you do a late return fine. Do you think they oh, let me do that if they wouldn't the let me do the DVDs? <laughs> no. no. What I did do, I will share this, is sometimes I did go to the J shelf. And it did slightly reorganize some of the books so yeah. that yeah. some of mine were just maybe a little more outy than they had been before. <laughs> but I felt that was one of the perks. It, it, isn't that an author thing? There's things that people have written books do. You go and reorganize shelves to, to give yourself a prominent position. Surely that's, <laughs> that's just one of the things you do in the job, right? All those, all those shelves behind Jay, behind Rachel, is, that's just so sort of practicing, isn't it? So, <laughs> it yeah. Is. Every one of those has got a library card inside it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do have so, a question from, oh, yeah. from Jade. Um, hello, uh, Mel and Rachel. I'll, I'll add Anne Andy. I'm currently doing the uh, Beginner's Fiction course with Faber Academy. Academy. That, um, what would your best advice be for bud a budding novelist? And uh, you're going to get two, two, two answers here. One you know, first timer in Mel and, um, and, and a rather more experienced with Rachel. So uh, should we start with you, Rachel? What's your uh, advice? Well, well, one of them is just really, it's so obvious, but you just have to keep going. You absolutely have to keep going. And it, and it is tempting to go back and edit what you've done. And I think that's sometimes important myself. Uh, so I'm not somebody that says just go through it, uh, you know, and don't stop. I think it's okay to stop and maybe make some changes or see that you've gone the wrong way. Mm. Um, my other piece of advice is take yourself as a writer really, really seriously. Because I don't think you can expect anybody else to do that for you. Mm. So, you know, find what your routine is. You know, if you're, you're like going, finding out that you need to be at the library at five to nine, that's really important to know it. And then make sure you're there. It's your right. Mm. That's great. I'd say, um, what would I say? Snacks, Jade, are really important. <laughs> Snacks are everything. And um, I would say, like Rachel, and it sounds really sort of uh, facile, but I would say, try and write, re try and write regularly. I found that really, really useful. I took myself more seriously if I was doing it, you know, at a regular time every day. I don't know if you can do it at a regular time every day. I don't know what your situation is, but try and be regular about it and you'll be amazed. You'll get through the bad days. There are awful days. There are, there are days when I just had these voices constantly just saying, what are you doing? That's rubbish. Well, that's not funny. Who's going to read that? All those negative voices. But if you keep going, as Rachel said, um, you get through that and then you get a good day and you think, oh, my goodness, this is the best thing I've ever done. This feels so great, you know. So are, are either of you two like tinkerers and that you'll go back and rewrite stuff and have these kind of moments where you're like a terrible critic of yourself? Rachel, are you quite bad for that, going back and changing stuff if you have like a, a bit of a, 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 you know, not a great day? Are you like that? Yes, always going back and changing things. It takes me forever to get the, 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 I think the first three pages though, four pages are so important. I mean, it's what people are going to, you know, it's, they're going to decide whether or not to read your book based on that. So why would you not really, really work them and make sure that every word is, is doing its stuff for you? Why would you not do that? You know, or just finding the way in, because I think a book is a bit like, you know, when you go to the theatre and you sit down and the, the lights go down and you just get that moment of just enchantment. Yeah. You know, when you, 
I think for me, a good book is like that. So of course you've got to keep editing and going deeper. Uh, Mel, your, the opening of The Best Things with the horse manure analogy is one of the finest openings to a book I've ever read. <laughs> um, did, you, did you write that and then think, oh, no, oh, no, I can't start like that, and then put it back in again? And, were, you, were you worried about starting a book with that? Because it's a fantastic way to start a book. <laughs> you know, I put that in afterwards. Did you? Yeah, I knew I wanted to start my book with, with two words, which are, ah, leatherhead. I knew... <laughs> years that I wanted the book to start with those two words um and the <laughs> horse manure <laughs> prologue actually I put in afterwards um that's interesting that you that you um I'm glad you like that I one. love it thanks and there's a bit of fact you see our leatherhead is there yeah. <laughs> And I, have, I have to say there's I, I you know my dad was Polish Lithuanian and the most famous piece of Polish Lithuanian literature is an amazing epic poem called Pantadeusz, and it's 300 pages long or whatever. It's a brilliant, brilliant story. The Poles love to think that it kind of belongs to them, and the Lithuanians love to think that it belongs to them anyway. It kind of belongs to them both. And it starts with the words, Ah, Lithuania. And it goes on to say, Ah, Lithuania, you're like good health. And I thought, if I could write a book that starts our leatherhead, I would <laughs> that's great. I'd make my dad really proud. So. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, like in, in, in my line of work, I normally interview, uh, say, you know, people in bands or, or people who do movies, that kind of thing. And I always feel like sometimes they can't recall what they what the thing is that we're talking about because they're already on to the next thing. And you guys mentioned earlier on that whole next book element of things so are you already working on the next one what's the normal kind of life cycle of the author over you have a book out and you're already writing the next one and it's hard to remember what was going through your head when you when you wrote the one that you're kind of talking about Rachel is that how it is when, you, when you're doing press about a book that you might have moved on from I think it sometimes is by the time you get to paperback which is where I am with this one but um partly because of look I've had a different kind of writing year thank you yes very good in the background. Um, I in that I have not, you know, my routine has not been the same. And even though I have tried to write every day, as Mel said, uh, because I do think it's really important, uh, I've it's not been as productive at all. Yeah. Uh, and I and I really have struggled much more with concentration. Having said that, I I have written a film script, so I have done something for oh, wow. um, for my first book. Uh, the unlikely pilgrimage of Harold Fry. So that that is being filmed. Hopefully, hopefully, I'm grabbing my 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 desk as I say it uh, later this summer. Wow! And are you allowed to say, Rachel, who's going to be playing the part of Harold Fry, or are you not? I think I am actually. I think I am. Well, you hear you heard it in Tring. It, it's Jim Broadbent is playing oh. is playing Harold. Oh yeah. wow, that's amazing! You did hear it in Tring. What about that? What a scoop! <laughs> Or, or wherever you are in the world, yes. That's a good point. <laughs> it came via train. <laughs> I think that's an album. An al I'm sure I've got an album. <laughs> that's amazing. What an amazing thing. And how's the process of um, film script writing compared to writing a novel? Is it a totally different? A totally uh, different yeah, area? I mean, it's been going on for years and years and years. Just this is the final draft that actually kind of made it. Um, but I, I came from a radio uh, drama background. So yeah. it's sort of scripts have always in, been in my, in my kind of, air, you know, that's my field. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't that wasn't that big a leap, but it's just an amazingly painstaking process of just, you know, finally lifting a, a book into a different medium that stands up completely as something that, you know, isn't the book anymore. Carolyn, but, Carolyn um, has chipped in. I heard Jim reading the book on Audible. He is <laughs> Harold Fry. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I can so imagine him as. Harold, oh, I'm so glad it's him. That's what an icon. Yeah. yeah. Now, a question from Sophie, which kind of connects with this. Would either of you like your books to be made into TV programmes? Uh, clearly, uh, in Rachel's case, that's, uh, that's yes. And if so, who do you imagine um, characters uh, playing the part? So, um, Great question. Or, or do you imagine, do you imagine the characters playing the part? Or now that you look back at it historically, is there somebody who you think should do it? So, I mean, Rachel, you've got more history here with um, with um, numerous books. 
Um, I never, I mean, I never imagine uh, actors playing them as I'm writing them because they're so much the people that they are, you know, in my head. I can't imagine anybody else being them. And I'm still not in that place with Miss Benson's Beetle. I can't imagine, I mean, other, you know, other people have suggested who might play them and that's great. That's a, you know, that's a really good game. But uh, I haven't quite got there yet. Um, the, I am, I'm adapting the music shop for Netflix and... Um, I'm beginning to kind of, in my head at least, you know, you have your perfect cast. But I think that's partly just, again, that process of lifting a book away from a book into another medium. What about you, Mel? Have you got plans? No, do you know, I haven't even, that hadn't even crossed my mind. And what you said just then, I, I know Frank and Sally so, so well. They're so embedded in here. I find it, I can't, I, can't, I was thinking, oh, hang on. Simon Pegg as Frank, so really, you know, thinking really big here. Um, <laughs> no, and then I think, oh, Rufus Hound is a bit, bit like Frank, and then oh, Sally. And no, I find I find it really hard actually. I find it really. So, hard. so you didn't you didn't write them with? Uh, sometimes you might see someone on TV or the thing that that that's the kind of person I'm going for. You don't start with someone that you might might have seen on. I don't know. I don't think so, Bush. I think they just these are these are the kind of people that are skittling around in in your head and growing and and talking to you and I do sound like I'm going mad <laughs> this does all feed into another question from Karen actually um were the characters in in, in Miss Benson this is directed to Rachel modeled on any, anyone in particular that you know in your own private life though is it a kind of a, a, a sort of melding of different people and characters I suppose that's the same question for Mel actually but Rachel in your case uh no I mean they did they kind of turned up really. I, I mean, I feel I was sort of being followed by them for quite a long time. I felt they required me to write a book about them. Um, and certainly Marjorie, the, the main character, was slightly based on women who as a child we called my grand, we called them aunts, but they weren't really aunts. They were my grandmother's friends who were unmarried and, um, you know, who'd gone through two world wars and now I think back had lost so many certainly male members of families and their lives. Um, but Enid Pretty, the woman that she ends up teamed up with, I have no idea where Enid came from. Apart from that, maybe I wanted, I felt I needed a bit of her energy. Because I started off saying I was going to write a really quiet, tender book about two women. And then I put these two women together and it just, there was no way it was going to be a quiet book. Yeah. But that's what I love about putting, you know, that we, you have a plan for a book and then you start writing it and actually it defies you. It has this energy of its own and all you can do is kind of gallop or try to yeah. run to keep up with it. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I, um, there are a few, my, my book has got a big old cast. I mean, there's a lot of characters in it and um, I think they're all tending to be based on people that I have met I would say, or certainly types of people that I've met, but usually actually specific people that I've met or come across. Mm. A couple of them sailing a little bit closely to the wind. Yeah. There's, there's one character in there who's um, the ex-girlfriend of a friend, and I'm a bit worried about that. <laughs> 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 it's a little bit close to the wind, but we'll see what occurs. Hopefully there won't be too much. Uh, is that characteristics or is that uh, name also no it's not the name but it's uh yeah uh, yeah i can't know i can't <laughs> is, is there something cathartic about writing about yes. putting someone that's been a bit of a pain in the past into into fiction oh yes i wouldn't agree rachel <laughs> yeah I, I think well i don't know i mean i think i've steered away from it i have i mean i think to begin with i did it more maybe than i've begun to do it now well, I think on the whole, even if you put in somebody that you think, you know, you know is somebody in particular, on the whole, I think you'll be glad to hear people don't recognise themselves. Mm. Uh, Rachel, there's an amazing story at the, at the back of the book uh, uh, about a photograph that inspired the novel. Tell us a little bit about that, because that's fantastic. Oh, yeah, well, that was, I mean, again, it was when I was kind of in the stage that Mel was talking about earlier, where you're just kind of, it's in your head and you don't really know what it is, but you're sort of collecting or stuff is coming to you, whichever way it is. But anyway, I was, I knew I kind of was doing a lot of research about Beatles and I knew it was going to be a female kind of woman's adventure story. I was really clear about that. Um, but I was trying to find my two women and I knew I had Marjorie and I knew I had Enid, but I hadn't really seen them. 
And then I was just taking a friend to um, an exhibition and it was just tucked in a little, you know, it was kind of an amazing exhibition and then just tucked in a glass case with, was the journal of May Morris and her friend, Mary Lobb. And um, they went on, they basically went sort of camping together. Um, uh, and one of them, May Morris is kind of, you know, is the social activist and the artist and the writer. And then Mary Lobb, I think came in to do the garden. But from what I read about her, really loved driving tractors, swore a lot right. and drank very heavily. She's my <laughs> kind of woman really. And, um, I just loved this photograph because the, it's one of those moments where the, the photographer has really captured who those women are from the way they stand together. And it seemed to me that the way that Mary stood so kind of just full on and kind of squarely looking at the camera, a little defiant, allowed Mary, May, sorry, the, to be the artist she was. But I felt they couldn't really be the women they truly were unless they were standing together. And I found yeah. that really moving. And it kind of became, that was for me, the theme of the book really, is that those two women need one another in order to find out who they really are. Yeah, they, they're wonderful. I love, I love Marjorie and Enid. It's an amazing photo that as well. Check it out at the, back of, at the, at the very back of the book. Uh, Mel, the dynamo at the center of the best things is the sense that Sally Parker's not in control of her own life. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that kind of feeling. Have you, have, you, have you ever felt that you're not in control of things, Mel? <laughs> every day but <laughs> no um we i mean i, I suppose the, the 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 idea for the book um came to me because i had a bit of a um a financial knock about 16 years ago um and nothing as bad as what happens to the parkers but um we stupidly stupidly um borrowed too much money from the bank and bought a house that we couldn't afford and then realized pretty blooming quickly that we had to get out and it was scary yep. it, was, it was scary we had to get out you know as quickly as we could and um kind of strip away all this all this kind of crap really that we'd thought would make us not happy but just that we thought we should have i suppose yeah and in tandem with that, I was reading, I, I'm a big fan of Anthony Trollope. I love Trollope's books. And I was reading um, The Way We Live Now, which is his amazing story about this horrid man, actually, Augustus Melmott, who invests very heavily in the railways that are being built at the time in the 19th century. And of course, loses everything. And I'm not saying, you know, our lives were in parallel to this or, or or anything but there were certain things that were happening to me that, that were similar this idea of money being this kind of weird thing that doesn't really exist you know yeah. when when you borrow a lot of it, it it's kind of mean it's sort of meaningless it becomes like monopoly money doesn't it um and I just thought about that a hell of a lot this whole idea of I mean the best things is a book about money and status that's what I'm kind of writing about that's what really interests me and this idea of um us needing a house to kind of say this is who I am and this is what I've got and of yeah. course absolutely rubbish you know um and and that's kind of the, the 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 theme that I'm really exploring in the book is that who you are essentially is not kind of what you have. It's what you, it's what you are and it's what you can bring to the table. And Sally Parker, who's my heroine, a little bit like Scarlett O'Hara, I suppose, who I kind of loathe. I really don't like Scarlett O'Hara very much as a heroine, but she starts as this kind of pampered, primping woman and it all gets stripped away. And, yeah. that's, you know, and that's when she knows who she really is. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were talking about social media earlier on. I mean, one of the strangest things with, with Instagram, particularly whilst we're all sat and cooped up in our own houses, unable to kind of have a proper reality check on the outside world, is that you can see what people post on Instagram and think everyone else is having an amazing time and everyone else has got a brilliant life. And sometimes the gap between what's being put out there and how people are feeling deep down is quite, it's quite a big difference, isn't it? And that can be stressful in its own right. Yes, absolutely. I mean, Sally, my, my heroine, and I do love her. She's very deeply flawed, but I do love her, is somebody who's kind of completely disconnected herself from, from what she is and who she is. She doesn't really know anymore. She's just living this insulated, mad, wealthy life. 
Um, and it takes all that to be stripped away for her to know kind of what she's capable of and what she can do. She's become very lazy. Um, Frank, who's her very wealthy hedge fund manager husband, speaks for her, does everything for her. She's got staff. She doesn't really know her children. Um, and it's it's about kind of uh, getting to know yourself, I suppose, through through a fa- through failing, really, through failing and through things going wrong. I suppose that's the kind of that's what that's what heroes and heroines do, don't they? Yeah. You, um, you put them through the ringer for them to sort of know what what um, what what they're about. I really enjoyed writing Sally's story, actually, because I think she does come. I hope anyway, I think she does kind of come through at the end. And, um, you know, I think she likes herself a lot more. And I hope as a reader, you kind of root for her. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And Rachel, there's a moment where Marjorie kind of snaps and loses control a little bit. So there's an inciting incident for her. Tell us a little bit about that. I think, I mean, I I was really thinking about the the similarities between the books today because they're both women who are kind of quite obstinate, really, at the beginning in the place that they've got themselves. Um, And, uh, you know, even though they are so different in in what they have, but they both, it seems to me, kind of need to go through this I mean, it's it's a sort of stripping away, isn't it? A kind of thing. It's like the ego has to go, in order for them to kind of find the people that they that they need to be at the other, you know, at the other end. So the things that maybe get them through when they were twenty are no longer going to work. I mean, for Marjorie in her forties, she has to kind of she really wants to find this beetle that her father told her about when she was a child, and it's a very complicated reason that she needs to find it, and there's no there's no guarantee that it's there. But, but, but her way of going about it has always been quite, I would say quite stubborn in that she's stuck to the, her, her known ways of doing things. And it's only in meeting the last woman that she wants to meet, this kind of extraordinary anarchic energy, you know, of Evenid Pretty, that she finally kind of finds that bit in herself. And I think for me, what it is, it's the, it's the creative female energy, which I think about a lot. And I mean, Enid, for all her chaos, I think has that. Yeah. Yes, she does. She's marvelous. I love Enid. <laughs> I love them both, but they they yeah, Enid's really stayed with me ever since I read it. She's. Uh, really- I've got, from, I've got a, a question from Alison. I've got to allow Alison Barrow um, um, a, a question. I mean, she's the boss after all. Um, I'd like to ask Mel and Rachel, what, if anything, did you learn while writing your book, either about yourself or about the wider world? Um, Rachel, come on, you, you take that on. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I did learn a lot about Beatles, about which I knew nothing. I also knew about New Caledonia, about which I knew nothing. Um, so there was all that. And then I was also learning about the 1950s, which I really, you know, I really wanted to learn more about. But I think the thing I really learned was about the freedom that I felt as a woman writing f- for women and writing a book that was supposed to be at the beginning anyway, all women. I had got to the point in my writing where I thought, I mean, I, why am I writing books with men at the centre? Even though the women in my books have been very important, they hadn't been the central figure. And I certainly hadn't written a book where two women were the central figures. And actually the story is about, it's not about them as sisters to brothers or you know, them, it's them in relationship to one another. And I found it really liberating writing as a woman for women about women. Great. Great. Um, I felt, what did I learn? I tried to learn about finance and the economy because there's this thread running through my story, which is the fact that there's a kind of an economic downturn going on, um, which uh, is part of the reason why Frank's kind of house of cards as a hedge fund manager collapses. I, I'm, I realised I'm so bad at taking on board information about stuff that actually doesn't interest me very much. I mean, the, the drama of it really interested me, but the nuts and bolts of the economy. I spoke to a very lovely, actually really hilariously funny hedge fund manager uh, from his castle wow. in, in Austria. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could 
make it up. He was actually brilliant. But I had about a three hour chat with him Oof, on my mobile. My ear was kind of roasting and he was giving me all the very sort of detailed minutiae about how how the markets work. And I was I'm afraid it was it was white noise. But as soon as he started to talk about, you know, characters in the city and the people yeah. I come across, I was absolutely I was absolutely there. So I could have probably learned more about the economy. Um, I did learn a lot about Leatherhead Golf Club. I spent quite a <laughs> great. Oh my goodness. Um, and about myself, um, I sorry, I don't want to sort of be swimming in Lake Me for, for too long, but there we go. I'll take a dip. Uh, <laughs> I think the stuff that I've always done has been obviously uh, performing, you know, performing comedy. And I, I really felt, felt confident, actually, probably for the first time in a long time through writing stuff on a page. It made me, it grounded me. Mm -hmm. I felt, if I wrote something that made me chuckle, I felt a bit confident, not smug. I just thought, oh man, this is, this is great. And it's sort of taken me um, to the grand old age of 52 to sort of think, OK, I, I, I you know, I don't know. I, I, I enjoy it. But you, you're someone, Mel, that's always up for a challenge. I think you always you, you love throwing yourself into different challenges. So you were fantastic in company. You were absolutely amazing in that. Got brilliant reviews and everything. <laughs> do, you, do you come Do you finish doing something like that and think, right, I was I, I did well in that. Or you're always your, your own worst critic with stuff, even though you've done well at it. No, I always think, and I don't know if you feel this, Rachel, Bush, maybe you feel it as well, Ben, maybe, and our audience as well. I always feel I haven't been found out yet. <laughs> Imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. I haven't been found out yet. But if I keep moving fast enough and maybe do different things, then I won't be discovered and I won't be found out. <laughs> um, no, I I want to write more though. I really do. I, I really want to write more. I I felt very happy writing. I mean, it was difficult at times, but I felt I was in a happy place, a happy zone. I want to write more, most definitely. Uh, Rachel, is, is imposter syndrome something that happens when with the first couple of books, and you and you kind of move out of that as you get more experience in writing? Would you say? No. No, it just is always there. I think, I don't know if it actually gets a little worse. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I've got to be frank with you. Um, I, I, I think it does. I mean, I don't know whether it's to do with getting a little older. Maybe it is. Although you think as you got older, you would get wiser. I always have this idea that I will kind of just be incredibly wise by the time I'm really, really old. But I'm not there yet. And I do, I definitely... Um, well, actually, I think it's part of being creative, that you question everything. And uh, I think that's a very healthy thing. And I think sometimes you almost have to be reduced a bit. You know, you have to go down to the bare bones of things. And I think it's actually something that your unconscious does to you. And it's very healthy, even though it's really unpleasant. Mm -hmm. So to doubt yourself and to think what you're writing is rubbish, you know, is appalling. Yeah. But it sometimes actually pushes you to a place where you really challenge yourself to think, hang on, is this really the truth as I see it? And then that's the best you can do. So I, I feel those demons, even though they're really hard, um, are, are just a part, a part of it. And maybe it's a good idea to go, do you know what? I'm going to make a friend of them. You know, yeah. they're just there. It's great, Rachel. Befriend your demons. <gasps> I love them. <laughs> This is like a, a self-help Zoom meeting, this, isn't it? My <laughs> friends, your demons. Uh, Rachel, we, we, um, and same to Mel as well, actually. You, it's a very personal thing writing a book, and you're talking about you know befriending your demons and, and just living with it and all that kind of stuff. But is there anyone in your life that you trust enough to, to give a three-quarter finished book to, to say what genuinely what do you think of this? Uh, Mel, is there anyone in your life that you, you, you get an honest appraisal from or you'd show it before it was finished to see what they think? Oh, that's, yeah, I... I um... I showed my sister actually and I feel bad saying I didn't show Ben who is my husband and is the absolute legend of my life and I you know but he's very very he hasn't read it yet I can see it from his bed he hasn't read Outrageous. it yet <laughs> he says he wants to read it when I'm out of the house and I'm like <laughs> 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 No, so I sent it to my sister, who is five years older than me, and she's very critical, um, but she's she know, she knows a story, my sis. 
she did you send the finished thing to her or can you can you send do you, do you do the whole sending the work in progress thing how does it work I sent her the first few chapters actually I, I really wanted somebody somebody to see it um so I sent it to my sister what do you do Rachel do you do you give it to anybody to read yeah I think it's very important that you find the right people to give it to so I do I do share it with my husband and he's very very good about reading it and he's got really really good at his response because you're just when somebody's reading what you've just read you're you're watching them like a hawk and <laughs> and it's so important how they respond and he he was an actor so you know he should know but he's got very good now at going yeah it's really really good and there isn't even a but and then and then he'll say and i think maybe and then we'll get to the hard stuff but actually that positive yeah it's brilliant yes is really important before you go to the kind of critique. And I think that's the thing, you know, when we were talking earlier about writing courses, that you have to be very careful when you do the kind of submission of your work to people you don't really know, how much ownership you let them have of your work. And, I, you know, and actually if, cause I, you know, I've done that and people can be, I think just through not realizing can be very bad at giving you critiques and can actually say things that might well stop you, you know, in your tracks. So I do think when you're doing writing courses, which can be great, you also have to just be very mindful of the criticism that you get back and not to take it all as the truth. Yeah, interesting. interesting. Totally. No, a question from yeah, go for Helen Paris, actually. Um, loving the generous back and forth and flow of two brilliant women. Uh, as women, you both have a background as performers. Does this inform you as writers, your characters' voices, how you write them, how you hear them? Does the page offer different freedoms for creativity? Um, Mel? Well, that's that's a lovely question. Um, I would say, personally, absolutely. There's uh, all, I loved writing the dialogue in The Best Things, and I, probably in a really narcissistic, self-centered, kind of I'm a performer type way, put myself very much at the center of all of those exchanges. <laughs> I, I couldn't help it. I imagined myself in the room, you know, being there with them and being among them and 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 stuff. So I would say personally, absolutely. And I come from a background, you know, Sue and I, um, comedy partner Sue and I, when we started out, we did character comedy uh, for years. We did it for seven years on, on the Edinburgh Fringe and character and dialogue is just something that, that's that's how you write a sketch you know that's certainly how we started writing and it's my kind of bedrock I suppose um so yes I would say definitely my performance background has yeah, the amount of people I, I heard I, I saw writing saying that they could hear your tone of voice you're almost speaking in their mind Mel when they were reading the book it, it's unbelievable it's uncanny Oh, wow. reading it to them in a nice way not in an unsettling over the shoulder type way maybe sat opposite them reading <laughs> that kind of, by a fire like Ben there that, that kind of thing I really want Ben to toast some crumpets on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking I need to put a log on here, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Rachel, same same question um, back to you, really, regarding, you know, your background as an actress. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, def well, definitely. I mean, it's a long time since I've been on stage. A really long time. Um, though I saw a documentary the other day. Have you seen it? It's, it's um, called the best. It's something like the best worst thing that ever happened, and it's about the Sondheim musical of Merrily We Roll Along, and a kind of, it's so moving. And if you love the theatre, as I still do, really passionate. I mean, nothing gets me like the theatre. And you were brilliant in company, by the way. Um, but that it's, I still kind of the theatre thing still works for me in the sense that I think that enchantment thing I was talking about earlier is so key uh, to books it's just how you weave the spell in radio drama it's really really important because it's so easy to turn the radio off and um and books are the same I mean it's so easy to put it down and go and find another one so in terms of the kind of theatre background for me yeah I I think that taking what you know and then making imaginative leaps in what you don't know is something that really feels just you know instinctive to me. And I think probably also having worked so many years in the theatre, you have, as Mel will have, just like you have a natural understanding of rhythm, just like the rhythm with which we speak to one another. 
and also structure. I think you, I mean, it seems to me really obvious from your book, Mel, that you really get structure. And I think it's something we sometimes even don't know that we know. But I think so many years of performing means that you do know when to deliver a hook, you know, when to deceive people a bit, when to hold information back. It's just all that, you know, that is about tension. Oh, thank you. I'll give, I, a, I'll give a little shout out to Helen Paris, who asked that question, because I can see she's um, she's publishing her debut novel in May, 13th of May. So well done, Helen. Uh, Lost Property, um, published by Transworld. So uh, there we go. Just yeah. like it. And one thing I meant to ask earlier on, when you finish the book, what, what do you do? Do you celebrate with a is it a glass of wine? Is it what, what do you do? Uh, a cigar? How do you what do you how do you celebrate when a book is finally finished? <laughs> I'm trying to think what happened. I think I pro I, I I had loads of um fizzy cola bottles. Um <laughs> my go to snack in the library. I, I'm sure I probably filled my mouth with fizzy cola bottles and let <laughs> And, and leapt around the library on a sort of sugar, sugar high. Um, I can't. No, I, I don't think any any bottles were. Mate, they surely they must have been. Must have been. Must have been. What about you, Rachel? I remember it really well because I'd I my editor had seen quite a bit of the book, but she hadn't seen the whole thing, and. Um, I, I, I got to the point where I thought I have to let go now, and I sent it to her. We were in Cornwall. I sent it to her. And then by the time we'd got home, and it's quite a long drive, she'd written back to me and said, I love it. And it was just one of those moments where you just, it was as if everything about the book just came to the surface. And I was thinking, it was sort of until she'd said it, I didn't know if it was okay. And then when she said it, I could think, oh, and there's that bit where they do this and there's that other bit where that and it was sort of like I was giving myself this sort of praise of the whole thing as if I'd never seen it before and it's it's never happened to me before but it was a really wonderful moment of just going just thinking well I did what I set out to do I did it brilliant I felt quite sad actually there's part of me that felt quite sad because I'd loved I'd loved being in it. I, I'd loved, yeah, I'd love that feeling of just oh, being surrounded by it. No, it felt good. Come on, it felt, it felt really, it felt good. But um, I feel a bit sad. Uh, Rachel, very quickly, let's talk about the Golden Beetle of New Caledonia. Uh, wh where did that, where did that come from? How did that kind of appear in your life? It's an amazing thing. Well, um, it was actually started many, many years ago when I heard uh, on the radio a cryptozoologist being interviewed. And a cryptozoologist, for those who didn't know, don't know, and I certainly didn't, is cryptozoology is the science, but it's not recognized as a science, of um, finding animals whose existence has not yet been proved. So the Loch Ness monster is kind of way out there. But this poor man was being given a really, really hard time. And um, I, really felt for him but I also thought cryptozoology that's so interesting because it's it's sort of I mean it requires knowledge it requires imagination wow. it requires faith it requires being really stubborn and you're going to be really really laughed at mm -hmm. and I I it just is right up my street that kind of thing but I didn't really want to write about the Loch Ness Monster because I, I do like writing about very small things <laughs> so I thought a beetle that's nobody's ever found and at first it was going to be a very ordinary, small, plain little beetle. And then and then I just thought, oh, no, maybe it's gold. It's got to be gold. It's, it's got to be yeah. gold. Yeah, it's wonderful. There's an amazing, um, there was like a blog that I read. Uh, the reviewer was called Simon Leather, which I thought was a fantastic name. But he oh, says, I know him. Yes. You know him? He says, as an entomologist, I must compliment Rachel on how she has managed to capture the entom entomological aspects of the story, and in particular, the passion that we feel for our discipline and our favourite species. So I guess if you're writing quite a niche, you know, about yes. a niche area of interest, you have to be... Right, and you want them on side, I guess, which goes back to the research side of things. It does. It, I say I know him. I know what I'm talking about. I don't actually know him. I've just met him, like you, like you know, Mel doing her research. I I found entomologists who would talk to me, and actually there were remarkably few, but he was one who did, and he was great because he just and and I found a couple of women as well, who I, and I found them really interesting, just talking about, you know, on the field, what it's like, especially as a woman. Um, 
you know, being out there in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, kind of things that as a woman you have to deal with that, that men don't. But Simon Leather was great as well, just for being incredibly generous with his time. Um, um, and both books have a fantastic uh, cover. I mean, Ben's held the, each book up during the course of the conversation here. Uh, are you guys involved in the, in the whole cover, this decision on the cover thing? What's that process like? I'm really, really rubbish with the visual arts. I mean, I love, I love art and I love looking at pictures and paintings. You know, Bush, you are an artist. You can do it. You can actually draw. Well, thank you. No, it's, it's the truth. Um, I, there was a wonderful woman called Yeti. That's her name, Yeti. That's a great name. Well, it's great, isn't it? And she just came up with the whole thing. She read an early draft of the book and she came up with it. And I was like, oh my God, that's brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. So I, I'm in awe of people that can that can, that can can do it, really. It gets we talked about animals that don't exist. I mean, that was, um, there's a great connection between Rachel's <laughs> last, <laughs> both of your last answers. Sorry, I'm just... <laughs> So um, Rachel, Rachel, the cover of your book was fantastic as well. There's a few different covers, but I mean, this one yeah. here, this, this is a, this is a, yeah. it just kind of draws you in, doesn't it? It does draw you in. And I love the, if you just open it as well, it's got a very, very lucky to have kind of beautiful foresty. Yeah. Uh, but there we are, you see. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the cover is, is so important because it's, you know, it's how, it's what people see. I mean, as well as those first few pages, it's how, it's the doorway into the book. So, and it tells you the kind of identity of the book. Um, it, you know, it, it gives you things visually that you're gonna get through words later. So uh, I think they are really, really important. And I'm very lucky that I am, um, I love both of them, the hardback and the paperback. Yeah. But again, they're a bit of, they're a bit of magic, the cover. Uh, one other thing that when, when I was researching for this, that was a lovely thing to, to hear said again and again about both your books was how people really, really enjoyed the sense of adventure at a time when they're trapped in the house, uh, you know, the, the, the road trip, the adventure, the exotic locations, that kind of thing. How important is escapism at the moment? Mel, let's start with you, because there's a bit of a road trip that goes on in The Best Things. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, it's weird, actually. A few people have said to me, oh, oh, you must have written the book in lockdown because the themes um, of the book are, you know, people having to make do with less maybe than they started with. And this is yeah. something obviously, that's going on in a very real um, and often very difficult way. But I have to say, hand on heart, I'd finished the draft before Corona had even, you know, happened. So... Um, it's just it's just weird that the two things have sort of slightly um, collided. I mean, I hope I, I do a lot of my reading on public transport wh when we're allowed to finally sort of go back and use the tubes and everything in London. I, I do most of my reading on the tube because I live out in the burbs and um, I love seeing people have a chuckle on public transport. <laughs> And then they laugh and you don't know what they're laughing at. I just that really tickles me. I always love that. And I was. I really, I really wrote the book with tube travellers in mind because I thought if I could write something that just entertains, uh, entertains a commuter, entertains somebody that's rumbling into London on a dirty old tube train and kind of takes them out of, of um, the, the carriage, then I would be very, very delighted and very happy. So, yes, absolutely, escapism all the way. And Rachel, the same for you, exotic locations, that'd be great at the moment, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, that was just a fluke because obviously I wasn't, I mean, again, like Mel, I was just, hadn't got, I mean, I didn't even know what a lockdown was um, yeah. when, you know, or the idea of face masks, all those things that we just kind of now got used to, and, you know, had no idea about. So I was originally going to set it in the UK and then I thought, but hang on, where's the adventure here? And because it was an adventure story, I, I felt that as a writer, I had to go out of, you know, away from what I'm comfortable with. So, um, also, as a writer, I think you have to keep challenging yourself to go, you know, to go to different places. So uh, I thought, no, not the UK. And then I started setting it in France. And then every time I read, I kind of wrote about them sitting like outside a boulangerie or something. I just thought, oh, no, I've, I've read this before. Yeah. And, you know, people have done it very, very well. But this isn't an adventure. And certainly the reader, it's not an adventure for them. So then I went, OK, well, I will go to the other side of the world where I have not been. And I will do that thing we've been talking about earlier, which is just a lot of research. And then I will imagine. 
Mm. Oh, wow. So you'd not been there. I was going to ask no. whether you'd actually been there or not. So how, how do you, how, what kind of thing do you do to research? I remember when we were looking at go, staying in a hotel once, we, that you can watch like a YouTube video of like a, a taxi driver driving down the street and see what it's like, or, or Google Earth and drop down with Street View. How did you research that? Yeah, that worked quite well for Harold Fry, I remember. Um, but then it, it, um, it doesn't really work in New Caledonia. There's just there are great there are great gaps where there just there there isn't any footage. So, but it was set it's set in 1950, so that it I felt it was probably better that I read diaries, journals. Um, I, I found a few kind of crazy pamphlets that were issued to American GIs during the Second World War because it was a base for for American GIs. Uh, for a period and these pamphlets I mean I think they're so politically incorrect um, now I mean just you know mind-bogglingly yeah I don't even want to go there but what they were good for was just uh, the kind of landscape and some sort of very basic French like uh, bonjour was kind of I think it was bonjour was how you say it (laughs) Tell you what really stuck with me with your the adventures of of um, Benson's people was uh, the boat journey. Oh my god, you you wrote that so brilliantly. I really felt that churning kind of claustrophobic with the insects. Oh, it was just so hor- I mean horrible, but brilliant and amazing. And the kind of the, the endlessness of it, you know, it went on for so long. It's very well, yeah, I mean, it would take six weeks just to get there. I mean, yeah. that's before you've even done any exploring, you know, six, six weeks on a boat. And, and again, that was something because I, for me as a writer, um, I've got to believe it. I've got to really believe it in order to be able to write it, even though I'm going out you know, into places I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I am. Um, and I was a bit stuck. I'd found a really good couple of books about those those uh, boat, you know, those boat journeys in the 50s. Um, and then we were clearing out my father-in-law's house and found a letter, half a letter actually, from his great uncle Monty describing the journey from Southampton to Brisbane. So the exact boat oh, wow. journey. That's amazing. How in bright. typed up print. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. There's somebody, um, sorry, Bush, you probably, you probably want to say, say something else, but I remembered with writing with uh, writing comedy, I got a brilliant piece of advice when I first started out, like, you know, years and years ago. And somebody said, um, I can't remember, a producer, a really good comedy producer, I can't remember who it was, but they said, it doesn't have to be probable, but it should be possible. And I, I love that. I love that. Um, I, I kind of try and keep that in mind. But you, you talking, Rachel, about you've got to believe it. You've got to yeah. believe it. Yeah. I love that. It's got to be, it's got to be, hang on, does I get that right? I think you've got it absolutely. It's plausible. I think yeah. it's plausible. It's like within the construct of your world, it yeah. has to make sense. But you're, you know, the world, and I think that's such, and that's another really, really big writing tip, I think, you know, and people don't talk enough about the imagination, you know, and how important that is. I think sometimes there's pressure on writers to say, oh, I, you know, that it was autobiographical or that, you know, you know, the place that you went. I think it's really important that we're writing outside our experience and try and trying to get, you know, be bigger. This is, um, I'm going to have to rein us in because... Oh, no, I know. But Ben, I you've just you've just put another log on Ben. This has been so brilliant, honestly. I don't want it. I don't. I don't want it to win any more than anyone else. So, um, <laughs> um, but unfortunately, we have to kind of stick to our as out as close to an hour as we can. Can I firstly say a huge thanks to Mel and uh, to Rachel? You've been absolutely brilliant. The pair of you are just uh, amazing. And oh. a big, big virtual round of applause from everyone um, uh, who's watching as well. Uh, Andy, thank you so much. You are you are the consummate consummate radio interviewer. Just- oh, thank you very much. It's been it's been lovely. It's been lovely to chat. Should we do this again next week? This has been great fun. Should we just? Yes. Well, you know, if you join me for any of my other ones, I've got loads loads coming up. But uh, he says, "What a beautiful link to uh, Mark. And then <laughs> quick, a quick couple of plugs." So on Wednesday, I'm hosting a an RHS and Dor- Dorling Kinsley. Um, a gardening event, would you believe it? So, uh, which is going to be great. Then a book launch on Thursday, Catherine Faulkner. Book launch on Friday, America Cobold. 
uh, Authenticity Project with Claire Pooley. Um, that's going to be next, the week after. Jonathan Dimbleby after that, which I don't know if this audience tonight would be a Jonathan Dimbleby audience, but you can always say. Um, Chris Packham then on the 22nd. So we've got a whole pile of people coming up. I tell you who would be this audience is Beth O'Leary. We're hosting her book, book, book launch for the road trip, which I, I can't help thinking there might be a bit of crossover. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, on the 29th of, um, of April, road trip, Beth O'Leary. Oh, I have to bring it to an end. I'm oh, sorry. Ben, thank you so, so thank much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. And so Rachel, so lovely to meet you in, well, in, in person, but you know, and, and to meet you and... Um, mm -hmm. You too, Mel. Really, really, really interesting. And I've loved your book. I mean, really loved your book. So that means the world, genuinely. Thank you very, very much. And I love the fact that uh, Rachel's lighting on her bookshelf. And I'm not sure what's happened to Mel's lighting, but it's your room is dark. It's just like we, we're not... <laughs> There's a mysteriousness. You're writing a thriller next, aren't you? It's a really, really sort of awful thing. I've literally... Put the spotlight on myself. Well, there you go. <laughs> I've got a desk lamp here and it's, yeah. A <laughs> metaphor for life. <laughs> anyway, it's, I don't know what Carolyn's mentioning, but she's saying it's probably blue. But That's I don't. Cool. <laughs> wall. Wrap that up, please, and say, your wall is blue, Ben. It just <laughs> is. <laughs> Listen, let's bring it to end. Guys, thank you so much. Let's, if, if, if I've got nothing on, we'll do it next week. So, um, but um, I, I suspect you all be. <laughs> but thank you so much. Andy, once again, Rachel, once again, and Mel, thank you so much. Thank we'll you. see you guys next time. Pleasure. Take care. Bye. See you guys.